And there have been lots of critics of that who have talked about other ways that the political philosophy can be spun and that political interests can be represented. Um, I guess I just wanted to say that in 2007, um, Maurice Duverger seems to be vindicated. We do seem to have politics gravitating to the left and the right, um, and that is one of the features of the current electoral season. Can I talk briefly about some of the things that are exceptional in this season from others? Thank you. I'm the professor, so I don't really have to ask, but uh, I sometimes do. Um, the first presidential election since Eisenhower that is open in which there is no incumbent. There is no president running for re-election and no vice president running for, uh, uh, for the office. That makes it an extremely competitive and fierce contest, and I think that explains some of the things that we're seeing this particular year. It is an election, whether you like it or not, uh, that is taking place in a time of war. You may not uh, agree with the war, you may have differing opinions on it, but there is one war, perhaps two wars, if you take Afghanistan and you take uh, Iraq going on, and elections in times of war are particularly difficult because it is the concept of changing horses in the middle of the stream and so on, and so it adds a dimension of uncertainty to how we analyze the election this year. It's also an election in the time when terrorism, again, whether you think that it has been uh, overblown or not, is very much on people's minds and, in, in a sense, is the backdrop to the whole process. Um, it's also an election in which one of the parties, the Republican Party, has lost some of its brand name. In other words, um, there is a question as to whether the Republicans still represent what they were uh, at a time when they were building uh, what they believed at that time was a new majority. Uh, less government, balanced budgets, no nation building. That was very clear uh, even when President Bush got elected. And those things have to some extent evaporated. And it's very difficult for Republicans to define exactly what their brand is, and it's certainly difficult for others to try to understand what that party represents, and that makes it also a time of, of uncertainty. Why did I call my talk uh, Fear and Loathing? Uh, I guess I should explain that because some of you are uh, a bit young and may not understand what, what that refers to. I have two books here for your consideration. One of them is the famous book called Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail of 1972 by Hunter Thompson. The other book is called Better Than Sex, Confessions of a Political Junkie. And it also deals with politics. But what's remarkable about those books is that they were written by a person who in 1972 or three when this book came out, essentially was a novelty. He was the inventor of what was called gonzo journalism. And gonzo journalism was the border between fiction and fact. And as Hunter Thompson's obituary read, uh, he threw out any attempt at objectivity. And essentially, fiction and fact blended with each other in ways that were undetectable and were entertaining, at least. My own view, and I apologize to those of you who are in the serious media who are here tonight. Of course, they're not here. They're at Hillary Clinton's event. But um, I propose that in 2008, 2007 or 8, we have a tremendous proliferation of gonzo journalism, that we have essentially something, it may not be quite like Hunter Thompson, um, quote, wild living, hard drinking, LSD crazed, and bent on self-destruction. Uh, maybe not quite that much. And most bloggers and people who produce things and put them on YouTube probably don't shoot out their TV sets with 357 Magnums with a bottle of wild turkey in the other hand, the way Hunter Thompson did. But it is still true that, a, and, and maybe I don't know them well enough, perhaps they are doing that, um, 
but certainly um, the, the line between journalism and other art forms has really been virtually erased. Um, and I'd like to offer to you, um, and I hope that you'll see this in an op-ed piece in a major publication, uh, if we can schnooker them into, into publishing it, um, that in fact this is very American. This is a country in which we have 50 brands of toothpaste in which everything is essentially bigger, schlockier, more, um, let's say, uh, unserious than in most other countries. And so why shouldn't the media also proliferate, uh, diversify, and in many respects appeal to people's personal tastes and interests? Um, the media of the past, the three networks, you know, when I was in college, there were three networks and one newspaper in town. Nobody read the New York Times because uh, that was in New York and not somewhere else. Um, but those dominated and therefore infused the discussion of politics as they, as they did everything else in society. And to some extent, I guess I am not concerned that... Um, most of the students at universities get a lot of their political information from uh, late night television comedians, uh, from Letterman and Leno and others. Uh, and that's because sometimes com complex things like politics or candidates can be boiled down and summarized in ways that are comprehensible and useful um, and that don't involve uh, you know, 1,000 or 1,200 word uh, essays in, in newspapers. Um, so, for example, we're all excited about the uh, 2008 presidential elections. As David Letterman said, um, there's some, there are some interesting p potential matchups. Uh, for example, uh, Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani. Uh, and he said, on the one hand, you have a pushy New Yorker with a history of marital problems. And on the other hand, you have a pushy New Yorker with a history of marital problems. So in a very short and succinct way, a lot of the dynamic of that particular matchup, sh sh would it occur, um, has been uh, essentially placed in front of people, and they therefore are able to uh, relate to the uh, candidates and, and their challenges. Um, there are other things that are really very gonzo-like. Um, I googled uh, the word political blogs this morning and I got 6.8 million hits. I googled uh, political podcasts and I got 5.2 million hits. And I googled uh, politic, political video on, on YouTube and I got 15 million hits. Um, that's different, isn't it? I mean, four years ago, eight years ago, if you Googled any of these things, first of all, you couldn't have Googled. <laughs> there was no Google. Uh, second of all, there was no YouTube. And media was essentially limited, and the ability of candidates to design, control, and project their message was a function of their own campaign. It was a function of how good their producers were who made commercials and flyers and other things that were sent out. And one of the extraordinary things that we're finding, and I think we'll, we're doing some research on this, uh, several political scientists are doing this, and that is that it has become virtually impossible for candidates to control their message because the um, media that's out there allows other people to produce things that define the candidates in ways often that the candidates themselves would never w want to have themselves defined. The gonzification of journalism uh, includes things like Obama Girl on YouTube. Uh, I don't know if any of you have Googled it and played it, but Obama Girl, the last time when I looked at it, had 3.8 million hits or views. Um, and it's a musical that essentially portrays uh, Barack Obama in a sort of very sexy way and it has a nice soundtrack and is certainly probably not uh, related to uh, foreign policy or to domestic welfare programs and civil rights. Uh, it is uh, not serious journalism. 
And Obama Girl, in turn, uh, morphed into a place called BarelyPolitical.com, where you can see uh, Obama Girl versus Giuliani Girl, uh, which is the counterattack uh, against Obama Girl, and a whole series of things which I think are having an impact on this campaign that we can't really measure. I mean, we're trying to do polls about the campaigns and so on, but how do you measure all of these things which are really the boiling up of the popular culture into an arena from which it had been fairly absent before? I mean, how many college students thought, you know, that it was really cool and fun to sort of uh, occasionally sample political commercials and political campaign stuff. Very few. I have never seen students more interested in politics in my 37 years at Iowa State than I have this, this year. The students are really interested. But they're not going to the sources that we normally attribute to the places you go in order to become politically informed. I asked my American government class how many of them read the Des Moines Register. Huh. I told David Yepsen the other day when I interviewed him for my Iowa caucus class, and he was very unhappy because the number was tiny. Out of a class of 160, there were, I think, something like, like 10 or 11 students in the class who actually had gone to the Des Moines Register uh, yeah, to get information. And so what we have then is um, a new form of political communication that is unconventional and that to some extent will have consequences that we at this point do not fully understand. But believe me, uh, it is having and will have consequences. Um, and in the end, my own view about gonzo journalism, and then I'll move on to a couple of other points, is that it's here to stay. You don't lament it too much. You don't wring your hands and say how too bad it is that this is happening. It's there. There's not much you can do about it. We are a country that has something called the First Amendment that very often people try to interfere with. And it would be so tempting to interfere with that First Amendment on all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't think it'll happen. And so what we have to do is figure out essentially how to build all of this popular culture and all of this uh, entertainment politics into the conduct of elections and into the conduct of especially the selection process because that's where we are right now. Let me add a couple of additional things that you know are exceptional this year. And everywhere I go, I was in New York recently um, talking to some alumni. Um, I've been a couple of other places talking to groups and these things come up every single time. This is an exceptional election because it is the first time that there is a, an African-American running who is running at the top of the field, who is well-funded, and who has a reasonable chance of doing quite well in some of the primaries and in the caucus. And there is a second very interesting first, of course, and that is that there is a woman who is running and is running very well and is running at the top of her field right now and is running in downtown Ames tonight. Uh, and I hope she's not running away from anything, but I invited her to come here and um, never did hear back from them, but because <laughs> I have some advice for her. Um, uh, on, it was very tempting on the radio show this morning, on my show, the Dr. Politics show, uh, I'd heard a rumor that she actually had been delayed and wasn't going to be in Ames until tomorrow night, but um, I never did mention that. Uh, I'm a nice man. Um, what do these two things do? They really create a, an intellectual and a moral and a historical discussion about this election. Because the question, as you might imagine, is always, Stefan, uh, what do you think? I mean. You know, can a woman really win an election this year? I don't know. You know, it's never been tried. The polls suggest that Americans, 90 or some percent, say yes, they would vote for a woman. But people lie in polls, so that's, uh, you know, possibly uh, something that we have to test in the field. And the other question is, can an African American win an election in the United States? And there again, the answer is, we don't know. It's never been tried before. That makes it an analytical problem for us because, you know, science is replication 
And when you run an experiment for the first time, you really don't have a database on which to try and build your analysis. But it is certainly a fascinating, interesting, and, uh, and, and very encouraging situation to have this problem in front of us because uh, we are a country that uh, is diverse and this is uh, an opportunity for the United States to test out its tolerance for that diversity and its desire for it. Um, this is also uh, an election that is going to be just extraordinarily strange um, because we may end up really having uh, some front runners uh, actually win the caucus, probably not the caucus, but perhaps the primaries and get the nomination, uh, and they're all from New York. So you could end up with Hillary Clinton running as the candidate of the Democratic Party. You may end up with Rudy Giuliani running as the Republican, well, sort of an unusual Republican in any case, and when I was in New York a week ago, um, the horrible specter of fear and loathing came up that there might be a third candidate who at the time was in England um, making some statements about how the Republicans need to get back to solid financial behavior and not overspend so much money. And as you probably know, that was the third New Yorker in this, uh, in this play, and that was Mayor Bloomberg about whom there have been many rumors and who himself has uh, substantial amounts of money, uh, more than Hillary and Barack and uh, Giuliani put together and could run a nice campaign. Uh, add to that the, the new twist, which is incredibly interesting, and I'm so glad that the conservative uh, pro-life community is doing this because it makes my life so much easier as a, a, an analyst of politics and as doctor politics, and that is that there is talk of running a third, third party ticket if Giuliani gets the nomination, because, and I have it right here, I have all my clippings here in case, because professors are always supposed to footnote everything, and so I have it here for you to uh, scrutinize if you want. Um, and that would be a very interesting proposition as well. Uh, I don't think Bloomberg would be that third ticket because he's pro-choice and pr fairly liberal, was a Democrat until recently and is from a city, as they say, that is a sanctuary city where uh, illegals are protected from deportation um, and therefore that would be uh, probably not a very uh, likely candidacy. But it's nonetheless interesting to see the sort of the, the tension and dynamics that are occurring this year, which are very, very unusual. Um, one of the things that puzzles me this year and that we've talked about uh, in retrospect, looking at previous elections and at previous primary seasons, and that is that there is really, uh, Howard Dean said uh, one time that in order to get white Southern Democrats with gun racks and pickup trucks, um, and he even said, I think, Confederate bumper stickers, back on the Democratic side and bring them back into the fold, the Democratic Party would need to run candidates or a candidate who would essentially connect with uh, a very large southern constituency. I'm surprised four years later that that hasn't come up except when I mention it. Now, Howard Dean ain't talking about it anymore. And certainly Howard Dean was not the guy to appeal to southern conservative guys with gun racks in their pickup trucks. So the question is whether his analysis was erroneous or whether, in fact, um, it is just simply too difficult to manufacture that kind of a candidacy in the Democratic Party, to find someone who kind of fits that particular profile. None of the Democrats really do. Um, and I'm not sure that any of the Republicans do this time around, which is uh, kind of interesting. Fred Thompson has been mentioned. 
Uh, but people who wear Gucci loafers to the Iowa State Fair and live in a Washington suburb and haven't gone to church in years because they only go to church when they're back in their hometown in the South and who have been lobbyists for uh, pro-choice uh, groups and their uh, firm has, has done work for pro-choice firms. doesn't sound a lot like a Southern, uh, an appeal to a Southern voter with a gun rack who is probably pro-life. So it's a very strange year because that particular constituency, I think, once again, is going to be essentially um, left untapped and is going to have to sort itself out. Um, I am beginning to have cold sweats trying to figure out whether they're going to sort out and vote for Hillary or Rudy. Can you imagine? Neither of them fit any profile at all on conservative, conservative Southern men, except that Giuliani uh, has that uh, sort of uh, mystique of being the mayor of the country and the champion of, of security uh, and the fighter against terrorism, and that Hillary Clinton, interestingly, is doing extremely well among women, and I think is doing well among women in all kinds of places. There is a real gender issue, and we always have a gender gap. Uh, you know, that's sort of a perennial. Uh, but normally, the gender gap is John Kerry appeals to women more than George W. Bush. Well, when have we had Hillary Clinton or a female appeals more to women than the, the male against whom she is running? It hasn't happened before. And so this time, and, and the Kerry Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics is very fortunate to have this phenomenon occurring, if it does, if she, Hillary Clinton becomes the candidate, because it'll be fascinating to see what happens, how the w female vote, how the women's vote sorts its, itself out this year, and whether you get what my good friend Arnie Arneson uh, in New Hampshire, she, she has looked at polls, she's run for governor of New Hampshire and, and has a radio show, and, and, and I'm on that show every Wednesday morning at 7 in the morning. I don't know why I agreed to do that, but um, it's, uh, it's before my second cup of coffee. Um, she says that the independents in New Hampshire are cutting towards the Democrats this time, and a very large percentage uh, are women, so that there is an interesting kind of, uh, you know, sort of demographic uh, uh, d diversity and, and divergence that is going on this year. My third observation, and again, these are things that you are well aware of, but I just want to bring them all sort of together so that you can see them arrayed around this, uh, both the Iowa caucuses uh, next week, or, or whenever they occur, uh, we're, which is, of course, my sixth point, is that this is a year when nobody knows when to make the hotel reservations in Des Moines. And some of the media people that I talk to are going, well, what do you think? You know, should I make my reservation at the Savory, you know, for, is it going to be maybe in December, or is it going to be January 3rd or 12th, or when? Um, and this is very difficult. I mean, hotel reservations and airplane reservations are hard enough. And when you just don't you know, have a good target, it makes the media basically crazy because they know that they're going to have to pay premium prices now uh, if they make those last minute reservations. But this is, this is the, the, the point I wanted to make. This year, more than any other year in history, uh, is the year of the spouses. There are spouses everywhere of both male and female gender. They are injected into the campaign in all kinds of ways, both delicate and not so delicate. Um, and we certainly know that Bill Clinton as a spouse is a fascinating phenomenon to watch because there is, on the one hand, the issue, excuse me, Hello? Oh, hi, honey. Um, no, I'm addressing a, a group here on the Iowa caucuses. Yeah, yeah. I'll call you back later. Yeah, I love you too. Yeah, I love you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Um, well, 
I'm not Rudy Giuliani, but it worked for me too, didn't it? <laughs> Having your spouse call you at various events and softening the whole issue of, well, how well does Rudy get along with Judith? Uh, the next thing you're going to have is his kids calling, although I don't think that's going to work because they're not talking to him anymore. So you have a spouse issue, but you also have a kid issue. And, um, you know, Michelle Obama is a wonderful woman, incredibly smart, very, very political, fascinating, very strong. But some people wonder if it helps Barack that she talks about him at home and she says he's both snorry and stinky. Uh, snorry, I mean, I have that right here as well. If you want to verify that, it's right here in one of these articles. He snores a lot. And she says, yeah, you know, he's really snorry. And he leaves his socks all over the place and it's just stinky socks all over the house. His, um, is, is that the campaign sort of image that his handlers want to project of the future president of the United States? Is that a good slogan, snorry and stinky? I don't think so. And the question is whether the um, Obamas have kind of coordinated this in order to make uh, it seem, f you know, comfortable and familiar. And he's just a normal guy. Yeah, you know, he was, you know, editor of the Harvard Law Review, and he got straight A's and well, Phi Beta Kappa, and you know, the smartest guy that ever went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and wherever he went. But he's he really is just a guy who snores and leaves his socks laying around. <laughs> Um, it may be, it may be very clever, and he is going up in the polls. So it's a whole new technique uh, in terms of uh, credibility. And um, obviously Jerry Thompson, uh, uh, Fred Thompson's spouse, um, is an interesting person. Uh, her, her forays at midnight on the telephone, yelling and screaming at campaign staff, uh, and uh, essentially wanting to dominate the campaign apparently are interesting uh, and since they were published in the New York Times they have to be true so I I assume that there's something to that um, and of course uh, Senator Edwards wife is a very interesting uh, spouse because she has a, a a very touching story to tell in terms of her cancer she has um, a wonderful personality, again, is very strong, is an attorney, is smart, is a great speaker, and uh, has been a, a very close ally of his in the campaign. But the issue has started to come up now, and in fact, he was asked on Sunday by uh, Tim Russert uh, why on some of the attacks against Hillary Clinton, uh, most of which are probably justified. I can say that because I'm not at her rally. Um, she has launched those uh, criticisms saying that uh, he would be much, much better on women's issues than Hillary Clinton and so on, as opposed to the senator himself uh, essentially taking these positions. And he seemed uncomfortable. I mean, he seemed really uncomfortable. And we don't know the answer yet, but there is some speculation that it is very difficult to run against a woman and not seem like you're beating her up if you're a guy, and that there is essentially this notion of a, a, a kind of bank shot, you know, that if your spouse takes the shot and you sort of stay out of it, um, that it doesn't have that that bullying effect. But on the other hand, it does, I think, have the effect of raising questions which people on the blogs and in other places, all of the gonzo journalists raise, which is, well, if you're dealing with Benazir Bhutto and she's coming to a cabinet meeting as Prime Minister of Pakistan, which she may be, uh, are you going to be kind of worried about dealing with her and bring your spouse in and say, honey, will you kind of take care of this for me? Because I just don't feel comfortable doing that. And, and of course, it's a false kind of argument, but it nonetheless appeals very greatly to the political blogosphere, to the critics, to all the people who are playing around with these things. And playing around with spousal things is um, you know, very popular among this new media that we see. Fourth, 
I don't see anybody taking notes and okay thank you um, and it is fourth isn't it this is the year when gustatory overkill has occurred already in Iowa never has there been so much food in a campaign as this year Christopher Dodd made the mistake the other day uh, of saying that he was shocked and had never heard of uh, deep-fried pickles and deep-fried Twinkies and he has said he had never seen so much deep-fried stuff that he'd never heard of which clearly disqualifies him from being president um, or certainly from winning the Iowa caucuses because of, you know when you're president Deep fried Twinkies are the least of your worries, aren't they? I mean, George Herbert Walker Bush went to Japan for a state banquet, and if some of you may remember, uh, whatever deep fried things he was served were so shocking to him that he essentially had to regurgitate them quickly at the banquet table. Um, clearly, he had not come to the Iowa caucuses and gone to the state fair. You know, because if he had, I think he would have been well trained for that. And that, I think, is my point. The Iowa caucuses serve an important purpose. There is one of them. It's, to te it's just to test these people's ability to deal with essentially unexpected things, right? I, you know, the, the headline, and I, I, I told Arnie Arneson's uh, listeners in New Hampshire, I said, you know, the headline this week in Iowa is two tons of beef. Did you see that headline? Two tons of beef. Two tons of beef is a lot of beef. I mean, uh, at our ranch in Columbia, we probably occasionally roasted two tons of beef and, and you know, s 16 bottles of aguardiente and so on. But this was Senator Tom Harkin's steak fry this year. Two tons of beef served. And, you know, Dennis Kucinich was there. And Dennis Kucinich is a vegan. <laughs> now, clearly, once again, you know, you have this problem, which is that in civilized society, people are used to someone saying, uh, do you want the uh, tofu burger or do you what would you like in Iowa? We don't do that. We figure that someone who wants to run for president just cannot ask for tofu burgers They can't ask for turkey burgers. They can't ask for anything like that They're gonna have to eat whatever is pushed in front of them and in this case it was two tons of beef and Kucinich is standing in the polls declined by six points that day because he basically refused all of this do you remember uh, Senator Lieberman? Of course you do. Uh, he's an Orthodox Jew. And in 2004 or three, when he was down at the state fair, I, I remember this very clearly. He was walking down uh, the main strip and someone shoved a pork chop on a stick at him. Jews don't eat pork. And um, it was a moment that you know was very frightening and uncomfortable and it was either he was going to go to hell and eat the thing but he didn't he handed it to an aide who ate it and who then since he was probably Jewish too probably is no longer with us <laughs> but you know these these are these are things that we in Iowa can do for the rest of America in terms of presenting candidates with unexpected situations. Do you think really that if President Lieberman suddenly was faced with President Ahmadinejad, President Ahmadinejad would be nice and politically correct and, and, and polite, he would probably throw something out of left field and Lieberman would have to deal with that just like he had to deal with the pork chop. So some of these things may seem trivial to you, but in fact they are excellent tests of a person's presidential timber. I'm not going to, because you all recently had dinner, I'm not going to talk about lutefisk. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Because you know what lutefisk is, most of you? How many of you know what it is? Yeah, okay, good. You don't know what it is, lutefisk? 
Well, it involves a white fish and lye, and it is very slimy. And um, it occasionally, when they go into uh, the Norwegian parts of Iowa, these candidates are, in fact, uh, served this dish. I don't know that any of them have ever eaten it, but they are certainly served it. So this is a, um, a very, very, I think, very good uh, challenge, um, and it spares the rest of the country the necessity of doing this. Um, let me talk about a couple of other things, and then I'm going to wrap it up because I know that there's a microphone there. Boy, am I worried about that, um, because I know that you have some things that you either want to uh, say and remember, we do have stun guns at Iowa State, so <laughs> say them quickly. Don't take too much time because, you know, we now have the Florida precedent on this and it, it apparently is going to hold up in the courts. We don't have actual live ammunition yet, so, you know, you can still take a chance, uh, but, but I, I would say just ask short questions. Um, this, this year, I, I finally realized that uh, 527 is the magic number. Um, I had kind of seen it before, but this year 527 has become so obviously the, essentially the secret manipulator behind uh, what we think are the candidates, the parties, the campaigns, and so on. What am I talking about? Is that Heinz 57? No. What is the 527? Well, it's a part of the federal tax code that allows organizations to collect giant sums of money and use them in very unscrupulous ways to launch all kinds of attacks against candidates and on issues uh, without suffering any penalty. I asked the group in New York if they knew who Eli Pariser is. I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you know who Eli Pariser is? Hands? Three people in this room know. Four people. Five people. Some of you are lying, so I won't, you know. Um, it's, of course, Eli Pariser uh, heads MoveOn.org. MoveOn.org is a very interesting organization, has the ability to collect enormous sums of money, has the ability to essentially hijack headlines for days, really for weeks, simply by putting an ad in the New York Times that says that uh, General Petraeus should really be General Betrayus, and essentially sets off uh, what are, I, I consider them to be really political uh, improvised explosive devices. Uh, you know, um, political improvised explosive devices. Pides, peds, pieds, uh, if you're French. Um, because these are things that are nowhere in the scripted plan of any campaign where these independent groups, both on the right and the left, of course there are the, the famous swift boat vets that came out of essentially right field and managed to do a tremendous amount of damage to, um, to Senator Kerry, um, the Progress for America Vote Fund and other conservative groups, uh, but in this case moveon.org, um, are able to uh, essentially change the discussion in American politics. And remember, it's not the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. These are groups that may very well be operating behind a firewall or with a wall of separation between themselves and the candidates and the parties. But uh, very often, in fact, there is not much coordination. Eli Pariser is a very powerful man. Uh, and um, he managed to create huge problems, especially for Democrats, because by attacking General Petraeus, it then set off a firestorm in Congress about a general, you know, who has 71% approval rating among Americans, who has served honorably, and um, it then produced this fascinating sudden turn of events, which I discussed with the one of the kitchen cabinet uh, to be of one of the presidential candidates. This is one of my former students. Uh, I have many of them working for a lot of different campaigns, but this one is working for a Republican campaign who was, he said, shocked and depressed 
because when the moveon.org ad uh, brouhaha blew, it was Rudy Giuliani who launched the counterattack, not his candidate, and Rudy Giuliani suddenly became uh, the champion of uh, taking on liberals and left-wingers and people who uh, basically want the U.S. to lose the war in Iraq and so on. I don't know if you really followed that story or not, but the way it happened was uh, MoveOn.org was given a discount by the New York Times to run the ad on the day that they wanted to run the ad, which was when General Petraeus started testifying in Congress. They were given the special rate that's given to nonprofit groups, which is about $75,000 or something, half the normal price for a full ad. Rudy Giuliani said, I want to run an ad defending General Petraeus and counteracting what MoveOn.org has put in here. And I'd like to run it on the anniversary of September 11, and I'd like the same discount rate. And the New York Times said, well, you know, for discount rates for nonprofits, we kind of pick the day that we run the ad. You can't pick that. So, you know, we might give it to you, but we can't tell you when it'll run. It'll run whenever we have space. And, of course, that in itself then became an issue. Because then the question was, oh, the New York Times give discount ads and places things on days when the left wants them, but when somebody from uh, the right, or at least a Republican, because Giuliani is, I'm not sure if he's from the right, wants to run one, then we won't do it. And it created this incredible feedback loop, again, among the gonzo journalists. It was unbelievable. You can't imagine all the places where this was discussed and it distracted the campaigns it created a problem for the other democrats because then there were resolutions introduced in congress condemning the ad and the uh, you know the question was is hillary clinton barack obama are they going to vote for this resolution attacking a very distinguished american general and they s were scared to death and barack obama never did vote on anything and hillary clinton didn't want to vote on it so they introduced some other resolution which failed but which she voted for sort of a soft resolution saying it's not very nice to be mean to nice generals who want to defend our country. But, you know, it essentially became another sort of a, a guerrilla theater or political theater, which was not built into any campaign strategy and certainly, though it was interesting, um, derailed some of the discussion from uh, where it should have gone. I want to say that the fundamental issue to come back to Monsieur uh, Duverger is that uh, in a two-party system there is in fact the potential and there is a potential tendency for divergence, polarization, and for politics to become really a blood sport. And with the advent of 527s who operate essentially as sort of poachers, kind of political hunters without a license, uh, on the one hand. And with gonzo journalists um, who can inflame and in fact exacerbate this polarization, uh, we have a situation where politics is not civil anymore in the United States, where politics has become really a kind of zero-sum game. and. People often say to me, well, that's just baloney. I mean, it's just the news media. You know, what's up with that? And, you know, radio, talk show radio and blogs and things like that. You remember the massacres uh, in, uh, in Africa um, in which uh, uh, Tutsis and Hutus went at each other and brutally killed each other and there were a million casualties? Um, there was one factor that was discovered afterwards that was instrumental in that happening. And that was something called Radio Mil Colline, which is Radio A Thousand Hills in, in French. And this was a radio station, just a radio station, that was controlled by one of the groups that essentially was the central command for giving out instructions over the radio about massacres that were to be carried out. And it was Radio Mil Colin that um, was instrumental in uh, the length and brutality 
of course, there were other factors as well. So when we underestimate the impact of a news media that is fascinated with dramatic stories, what used to be called yellow journalism, uh, it, it can't be called that anymore because most, most of it, except for a few of the serious reporters, I don't know if David Yepsen is here tonight, but uh, I admire him for uh, occasionally keeping a cool head. Um, other times when he deals with the universities, uh, it's a different story. But uh, this, is, this is something, I think, that brings us to the 2008 caucuses in which there, there is this convergence of factors. On the one hand, uh, a media that is very much freelance, and on the other hand, independent groups that have the ability to launch uh, political attacks that are uh, provocative and that in fact often on the part of the 527s are not really intended to help one candidate or another but are intended to help the particular 527 group that's launching it. Because the first thing that Eli Pariser said, uh, and this was last week in the Times, he said, yeah, we had, you know, $500,000 contributed to us after we launched the attack against General Petraeus. This is really great. You know, it's a great fundraising strategy for us, and we're getting more members signing up. And, and so there is, in, in, in effect, um, you know, a kind of entrepreneurship that has nothing to do with selecting candidates or running for office or getting someone elected president that is operating now in the system and that to some extent probably ought to be examined because the consequences of it are probably not very positive for the country. So with that, I thank you very much and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great honor and, and guys, thank you all for coming. Uh, and I think we're gonna open it up for questions because I see Pat Miller uh, back there negotiating the microphones. Thanks a lot. So please help yourselves to the microphone. Oh, also help yourselves to some food, I think, that's left in the back, if you prefer. But questions or comments? Remember, you get 10 extra points if you ask a question. <laughs> that only applies to students in my classes, but yes? Well, Pat Miller can make it on. She can make things happen that... Go ahead. You were saying that this is one of the first actually open elections in a long time and there's been no vice president or anything like that running, but is that really the case? Because, I mean, doesn't Hillary Clinton already have a lot of the advantages of the vice president? She's got the former president endorsing her, former president endorsing her, and probably a lot of uh, that president's former staff Your, your, your question is very interesting because that's one of the assumptions as to why Hillary Clinton is doing well because she has uh, a machine behind her that's already been in the White House. She has eight years at least living in the White House. Um, on the other hand, it's a little different from the sort of official functions that are carried out by vice presidents when they get ready to run at the end of somebody's second term, let's say. So there's probably some difference. And in fact, as you know, there are p potentially some disadvantages which we may see erupting a little bit later to being um, the spouse of a former president. Um, you know, that's been one of the questions as to whether that is going to, in fact, become a, a serious debate about dynasties in, in politics. You can, you can talk into that microphone and you'll feel better, but... <laughs>
I was going to, as part of my talk, drill into the relatively small literature on caucuses and, and presidential selection. And one of the, the, the pieces of research is that there are two indicators that are very reliable in predicting who is going to get a nomination. One of them is money. The second one is how well you're doing in the polls, especially now and even closer to the actual caucuses. And if we use those two indicators, the answer is um, probably not. That, you know, if you're not, if you're not getting insufficient funds and if you're not high enough in the polls, the chances that you're going to have uh, some sort of uh, catharsis happen or an epiphany will occur that will launch you forward is not very good. Uh, remember that people say, yeah, but look at, you know, Howard Dean. And, you know, he was going to win and then he didn't. But if you're talking about the top three, they can change positions. So Hillary Clinton is first now in the polls and she may be second or third and so on. Um, but to have someone who is seventh or eighth and has very few resources and has you know, single digit approval or zero approval as some do in the polls, uh, the chances are not very good. And that raises the other question which I haven't addressed and I, I'll do that at the, you know, the, um, the next talk I give if, if there is another talk. Um, somebody hopefully will invite me to do one. Um, and that's how people actually become candidates for president in the first place. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of people running that we now say, gee, you know, why isn't Christopher Dodd doing better? Well, the answer is because he should have never been running in the first place. Why, where did Christopher Dodd suddenly come from that he and not the other, you know, 33 Democrats or however many there are in the Senate. I guess there are more than that, but uh, at this point, not many. Next time, there will be a lot more because Republicans are dropping out like flies. But um, why Biden and Dodd uh, and Richardson and so on rather than any of the other many very well-qualified Democrats? We have a strange process in which uh, it's essentially... A freelance operation in which you launch yourself uh, and say, I'm running for president. Uh, if you are good at it, you get a, a bunch of federal matching funds that you can spend. You know you're never actually going to make it, but you've got a lot of money and have a lot of fun traveling around the country, driving people crazy by being on the debate panels uh, when you, people really want to hear the you know, serious candidates. But uh, Mike Gravel and others you know, cough up some incomprehensible stuff that then derails everything you have to get everything back on track is that too harsh I don't think so um, there ought to be a better process for essentially saying no you're not a, a candidate for president We're, you know you're not gonna come up on this podium I'm sorry that's just the way it is um, and the parties ought to have more role in it I think the parties no longer play much of a role in all this it's it's essentially entrepreneurial yes and we, now you don't have to speak into the stand because we know there's nothing there to speak into. It's, uh, this is Iowa State University of Science and Technology. But the other, the other individual whose name, um, besides Eli Pariser, people ought to know is uh, Marcos Molitsis. Anybody know who Marcos Molitsis is? Who is Marcos Molitsis? Suniga. And the Daily Coast is a blog that is incredibly influential, that had this year again and this year it was serious the not daily cause but the annual cause which was a big convention of bloggers to which the democratic candidates all went with their hats in their hands essentially to um, pay respect to the bloggers and the daily cause is one that I would look at simply because in the Democratic Party it has a tremendous amount of, of cloud and influence and visibility. Ariana Huffington's uh, blog, The Huffington Report, 
if you can stand, um, you know, some of the quirks of it, um, is is also very good. And there are lots of blogs on the right um, that, you know, if you if you what what I would do if I were you is I would Google the New York Times, go to their elections uh, page. In my course on the Iowa caucuses and the presidential selection process, which will begin in a week, which is an online course, which you can still enroll in because we're still enrolling students. It's uh, continuing education um, is doing a wonderful job in helping me really enrich this thing. You can find it at iowacaucusclass.com. The reason I had to buy a domain is because the domains that we give at Iowa State are so long and have tildes, so you can't say them to people because they can never remember them. But iowacaucusclass.com, we are going to actually direct the students one week to the list of uh, conservative blogs that are in the New York Times political campaigns page and they're all hot linked and then the next week we're going to direct them at all the liberal or, or democrat uh, blogs and at, that's the place to go to it's like a little buffet you know it's like a, a little salad bar uh, where you can go down and click on them and you'll find some very interesting ones We have a microphone. Wonderful. You mentioned the power of the radio, and I thought of what happened to the, what country radio did to the Dixie Chicks after their comment. I just thought that was interesting. I was curious what you thought was going to happen to Blackwater or with the new fines. Blackwater. It's, Blackwater is just a symptom of our effort to pretend that the federal government has gotten smaller, and I, I, you know, those of you who have taken my American government class, you know, I've talked about that, right? Where you show that the number of federal employees has declined and is small, but then you throw up a pie chart of the budget of the federal government, and it's huge and getting bigger. So you're going, well, there are less federal employees, but the budget is getting much bigger, so what does this mean? It means we're outsourcing everything. You know, we're hiring a bunch of people that don't show up on the books. It looks like the federal government is smaller because, yeah, we're going to get rid of those bureaucrats. You know, we're going to fire them all. And, yeah, but you're going to go out and hire a bunch of private people and pay them just like you were the bureaucrats. But then they operate outside the scope of federal civil service, outside the scope of accountability. They are no longer under any of the administrative agencies with the kind of checks and balances that not only occur between the president and Congress, but checks and balances within the administrative bureaucracy. We teach that in public administration all the time. And that is what Blackwater is a symptom of, and Blackwater isn't the only one. It's happening all over the place. And so I think the next administration very likely isn't going to increase the number of bureaucrats because it's tough to do, but there may be, and I think there will be new accountability rules that are uh, essentially imposed on private contractors and how they behave and, and what they have to respond to. And Blackwater um, will survive, it's very necessary. We can't operate in Iraq without the 100,000 or so private security forces, not all of them Blackwater. We just can't do it. I mean, we have almost as many non military military um, security forces in Iraq as we have military to protect everything and so you know you'll change the name to you know brown water and then you continue to operate and it'll be a new company I mean you've heard about it incorporation and you know disincorporating and reincorporating and that's you know something that you, you can do as well yes you mentioned before about blogs and YouTube and untraditional forms of politics. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about um, in the future if they're going to become like radio and television has and have a stronger government and political presence. I think the blogs are evolving anyway. They're consolidating. Some of them are becoming sort of the New York Times of the blogosphere and others are, you know, like, 
a little, uh, you know, socialist or uh, right-wing fascist newspapers that have survived just during the period of the non-traditional or of the traditional media. And in the same way, I think some of them will become uh, essentially uh, and already are very important players, very big players, uh, and others will disappear, recombine. But I, I think we we have a new reality, and the new reality is that it really no longer is essentially an elite controlled media that tells us this is what's happening. It really is in many ways, it really is in many ways, it really is in many ways, 